Hey everyone, Ari Labs here with the Spending Time Podcast. Um, I'm joined by a Blog to Watch team member, Aaron Shapiro, for this podcast. Uh, Aaron, welcome. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. So we're talking about an auction right now, and you know we don't really talk about auctions too much. There's a lot of reasons behind that, but what I thought, what I think is interesting, is when you see a collection of a person and you get to talk about what that person's tastes might have been like. And so what we're talking about. Uh, Sotheby's has an auction happening a few days from now, actually. Um, it's the collection of Marsha and Robin Williams. Uh, Robin Williams, obviously the actor and comedian that um, uh, ended his life with suicide a few years ago in North Northern California. Big shock to everyone. I was a massive fan of Robin Williams. And now there's, I don't know how many hundreds of lots um, as part of this auction. But a lot of them are, are wristwatches. Aaron, did you know that Robin Williams was a, a watch enthusiast? I did not. Um, I actually wasn't aware of his collection at all until I saw this Sotheby's auction. Yeah, so I'm, I'm scrolling through here and we're looking at a lot of artwork and stuff like that. I think what everyone needs to remember before we start talking about this, and I have some comments about uh, Mr. Robin Williams, but this is not all of his watches, and this is not all of the, the, the couple's items. Um, you know, they over the course of many years like most you know important couples uh, acquired many many items things they purchased things that were gifts and you know they downsized so this is the things that they're okay getting rid of um, you know I know certain watches that Robin Williams had loved and had for many years that are definitely not part of this lot right so there's things he owned that are certainly not being sold why not right. they're given to family members they're kept as sentimental items um, but there's still a fair number of watches here really wide variety of stuff um, to talk about. Now, Aaron, you and I know sort of a, a very open secret, if you will, and that is that celebrities don't always buy the stuff that they have, right? Right. And so I know for a fact that Robin Williams, because he was famous and because he was a real watch lover, had been courted by many brands. And so when we, when we look here um, at the products, I think that you have to ask yourself, you know, what is something that he was given as a gift? What is something that he purchased himself? And what did he get um, from a brand uh, by working with them? Whatever. I'm not saying that like he was in an advertisement, but you know, brands wanted certain people they liked to wear their products. And uh, I actually had an opportunity to meet Mr. Uh, Williams when he was alive, um, which was which was a really great experience. He was such a nice guy. I mean, unbelievably nice guy. And he was wearing at the time an IWC uh, chronograph, the pilot's chronograph that was the one of the Top Gun ones. You know the watch I'm talking about? I do. Is that, is that the ceramic case Top Gun one? It was a ceramic case Top Gun. So there are two IWCs as part of this auction. Uh, yeah. Neither of them are the specific watch. So that is an example of a watch that he owned and loved, um, but that isn't part of this. Now, he, he was a friend of IWC. And it's unclear sort of, you know, where he where he got that watch and what the circumstances were around it. So I don't know that he bought all of these. He has here, for example, a, you know, Lot 150, a Platinum, okay, that's not cheap, right. uh, you know, uh, Pilot's Watch Chronograph, you know, with the in-house uh, the seven-day movement. That's, you know, I don't know. Is that a watch you buy for yourself? Is that a watch you're given as a gift? You know, and then he has a Titanium um, Pilot's Watch Perpetual, perpetual cal Calendar. Yeah. yeah. And the funny thing is, you know, both of these watches are estimated to go for around the same amount of money, uh, you know, a little bit more for the for the platinum one. Now, I'm specifically not going to mention anything about value. I mean, we can talk about it, but mm -hmm. I think that, and, and tell me if you agree or disagree, but when it comes to these auctions, a lot of the time, what it is that we need to consider is that you don't know who's bidding. Uh, Collectors have very emotional reasons for getting things. Sometimes it's a bidding war, so they're, they're going to pay more than they, they normally would have. I don't look at auction results almost ever as being an indicator of what the street price is. You can, you can definitely see what's in demand and what's not in demand, but I reject the idea that any auction price achieved should by itself represent um, a value that anyone else on the planet um, is willing to pay. Because it's one anonymous person on one day, you don't know their state of mind. You don't know the circumstances. Paid a certain amount of money for it. Do you do you agree or disagree that these the achieved prices should not be taken by anyone as a indicator of street market value? 
I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that this particular auction is probably even more of that type of scenario because you're dealing with a celebrity's collection. Exactly. So, you know, folks might be willing to pay more hypothetically for these particular watches because of their tie to, uh, you know, what I believe to be a, a pretty widely beloved actor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, in that IWC, uh, the, the top gun one, you know, I saw pictures of him on magazine covers wearing that exact watch. Yeah. That would have been the exact type of situation where, where the, the value of that, because it was worn and loved by this, you know, really well-known and well-regarded, you know, entertainment personality would go for a lot more. Of course, it's not even here. Right. Now, it says the Marsha and Robin Williams collection here. Um, there seems to be one Bulgari watch and maybe this, this Cartier one that is for women. Um, but for the most part, these are these are all men's watches. This this appears to be pretty much all of his things. Would you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, would you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree. So let's just look at this collection here, and, and what what surprises you? What in here you're like, oh, I didn't I didn't think he'd be wearing this, or I didn't think he'd own this. Um, I think the first thing that jumped out to me was some of the, I mean, if you will, some of the lower end pieces. Um, a great example of that would be uh, lot 114, which is a, a PVD coated Luminox. Um, you know, they have a very low estimated value on that here, but I just found that to be really surprising. You know, this is a funny thing, and we can we can sort of wonder about how this comes about. Luminox was run in Northern California, just a few miles from where Robin Williams was living. It's entirely feasible that he was asked to go to an event. He was given this as a gift. You know, it's little things about sort of this geographic proximity that I know that not a lot of other people know. So with this Luminox, um, I agree with you. There isn't a huge chance that he bought this. He was yeah. probably given as a gift, or maybe he went to an event. He did as a favor as a brand. But this is the exact type of situation where, like, no, nah, I'm not sure if he got it. What interests me is the tool watches. Yeah. That he has. Let, let, let's look at some of these things here that are interesting. There's a few. But first, there's the the. I'm talking. I'm going from like least nerdy to most nerdy. <laughs> you have one of these Oris. He has a few Oris watches here. Um, yeah, there's, there's the di see. there's the regulator style diver. Mm -hmm. You know that that shows that that Robin Williams, at the very least, was was into watches enough to be looking for things that were a little out of the ordinary. If you look at all these watches here, he wanted to make sure that he wasn't wearing something that looked like anything else. And if you'll notice, sure. I, I mean, I I uh, I don't think I, maybe I missed it, but there isn't a single Rolex here, not one. Uh I was thinking that before we started recording, actually, there's there's no sub, there's no you know there's no Daytona, there's nothing like that in this collection at all, and that was striking to me when but I there first started. There is a kind of limited edition it. 1996 Mercedes Benz SL500. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so okay, so there's the Oris one there, and then uh, another example is this uh, Jaguar Lecolt. This is one of their. Okay, so this is a a chronograph. Diver's watch. I believe this is the one that has the depth gauge. So this is lot 144 here. Let's take a let's take a look at it. I now this watch is, you know, it's weird looking, <laughs> and it yeah. has. If you look on the the left side of the case, there's this area that looks uh, like it shouldn't necessarily be there. But this is where this is where water would enter, and there was a mechanical depth gauge. So, you know, this complication was really only ever useful if you were diving. Yeah. You know, if you didn't dive, it was just this weird thing. So um, I know that Robin Williams was an avid cyclist. Um, given the amount of dive watches he has, I'm guessing he was also a diver. But this is essentially a toy. This yeah. is a, this that that type of piece isn't to show off to anyone. That is a expensive diver's toy. Um, and then probably the most nerdy is what is this lot uh, 126? This isn't even a watch at all. The this compass. is a, yeah. This is I've seen these before, and they're they're cool. They're massive, but this is a vintage style wrist worn diver's compass um, by Panerai. Um, they're guessing this goes between fifteen hundred and two thousand bucks. I'm actually thinking this is gonna be surprising. But let's let's look here on this watch. Okay, this is a picture. Uh, this is not like a new out of the box. There's a bunch of gunk on the strap here. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look scratched up or anything, but like. I, I'd like to think that he actually wore this watch. 
Yeah, which, I mean, it's interesting to think of him wearing a diver's compass that isn't something that you would just wear casually. Maybe he was riding it while I was, you know, wearing it while he was riding his bike. Yeah, that would be cool. You know, look, look at this black stuff. Like, what, what is that? that? Is that yeah, like, was I, he working on his car wearing this? It kind of, you know what it kind of looks like to me is a watch that was worn a little bit and got kind of damp and then was put into a watch box. Maybe, maybe. I'm just, you know, he, he when you wear this thing, not only is it massive, it's 60 millimeters wide. Yeah. But... It, again, it it doesn't tell the time, so it's it's exclusively like, oh, what are you what are you doing it? So yeah. if you look here, I like this interesting catalog note. Um, the warranty card made out to Robin Williams from the Panerai store in in Beverly Hills in in 2006. You know, that's pretty cool. So does that mean he went in there and bought it? You know, does that mean that it was uh you know a, a gift? It's it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But I'm I don't think that a watch like this would be given to celebrity just as a gift. Like, oh, Mr. Williams, we really think that you'd love this. Like, he has to express interest in this thing. And yeah, I and think. I, Go ahead. In a little bit of the in a little bit of the research that I did regarding Robin Williams and his watch collection, when I first saw this auction pop up. It, they, it, there were reports of him being photographed wearing Panerai's, so he was a fan of the brand. Well, he was a, he was romanced by the brand as well. Let's be honest. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And there's a couple of you know there there are two other that I can see two other Panerai's that are in this auction too. Yeah, there's a, there's a few, and if you look at Richemont brands in general, there it's it's very well represented. And again, like I said, I know that he was working with IWC. Panerai yeah. is also part of Richemont. Um, you know, I'm trying to. There's a bunch of IW, a lot of IWCs here. Panerai for sure. That's part of Richemont, as I said. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, look at Graham. Okay. I, yeah. There's one, two, three, four, five, five different Graham watches. Um, you know, and and again, you might think to yourself like that's not really him. But remember, he liked watches that were very visually bold. Yeah. And I can totally see. And you look at the dates of these Graham watches. This spans over a course of, of several years. There's three or four. Yeah. So he was interested in this brand for three or four years. This is interesting. Lot 138 and 139, two of the same Bell and Ross watch, just different colors. In different colors, right. Right? So Both so, from the same year. Yeah. So he basically bought these at the exact same time. What, he couldn't decide whether he liked blue or orange more? No, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, this shows him, in addition to being somebody who likes certain designs and wants to sort of have a robust collection he's also fashionable you don't get two different colors of the same watch unless you think to yourself boy i couldn't possibly wear the blue one when that when an orange dial makes more sense sure and so you know i mean again he was he was he was always you know considered a well-dressed person but this this shows um a considerate level of of not only wanting to be in, into watches but really wanting them to to fit the the theme or the the aesthetic that he was going for and that's just that's something you really don't see very often at all um gerard perigo definitely a few of those but again look at the gerard perigo ones these are these are tool watches uh there's very little here that's just a three hand mm -hmm. right there's, yeah the, the world timer the yeah the, so you have yeah you just have a bunch of stuff there um, but everything even the you know like maybe the Jager okay that one you know but that's a do that has two different uh, uh, dials to it um, I want to look at the watches he purchased in the 1990s um, because I think those are more purely what he would have bought with his own his own interest, right? I think into the 2000s, he was starting to be a little bit more romanced by brands and mm -hmm. maybe he was getting special deals or stuff like that. But in the 90s, I think it was before a lot of that was going on. Yeah. there's The one that I think is really interesting in that regard is Lot 148, which is circa 2000, but it's a, you know it's an AP Royal Oak. Um, With the plastic still on it? That's what I was going to say. Is look, is looking at it, it doesn't look like he ever... I mean, I, I, I don't know, but it doesn't look like he ever wore it. Well, let's let's look at the size, because I actually suspect this is a woman's model. Uh, that would make sense. Uh, yes, this is 37. the 37 and a half millimeter one. So in 2000, that would have definitely been considered uh, small for a guy. He had... He wasn't he wasn't a massive man, but he didn't have small wrists. And if you look at all the other watches here, there is not a single men's watch he wore that was this small. So I think this is definitely on the Marsha side. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Let's let's look, move on here. That's interesting. You know what actually stands out to me a lot? Circa nineteen ninety, a Daniel Roth. Yeah, I see that. Lot one forty six here. Now this is now this is this probably represents the type of of 
mechanical watch that really began to interest him. Because again, he didn't start with Rolex. He went straight to interesting stuff. No idea what he's wearing in the 70s or 80s. There doesn't seem to be any of that represented here. And again, I'm mm -hmm. guessing those are more sentimental items. Um, but this looks to be in, in pretty good condition. Unclear whether or not it was really his taste. I mean, you know, the, they're going to want to clean these watches up and make them look as nice as possible. Probably didn't wear this thing a, a ton, but this right. is a Daniel Roth perpetual calendar in white gold. You know, uh, let's see if there's any special notes here. Um, again, just, you know, a guarantee booklet made out to Robin Williams. Now, when that's set, when it says that, that means one of two things to me. Either he purchased it himself or the brand uh, wanted him to have it. Because usually if someone's buying as a gift, then it's not the name of the gift recipient who's going on the guarantee card. You know what I mean? I do, yeah. Um, so that's that's actually one of the most interesting ones. Also, around that same time period is an Urban Jurgensen. Yeah, I see now, that one you too. You don't you don't just look at like GQ and learn about this brand. He was he was in to independent watchmakers. He was into horology and fine watchmaking. Um, you know, this would have represented a smaller watch for him. It was 38 millimeters wide. But, mm -hmm. you know, you don't you don't get watches like this ever unless you're, like, deeply, deeply in the hobby. I don't care how much money you have. You have to know watches to, to be interested in something like this. Would you would you agree that from what we're, what we're seeing, um, this is a collector that, that we feel really knew watches as opposed to was interested in brands? Absolutely. I mean... That's 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 specifically kind of expressed just in his fascination with complications in general. Most of these watches, with some few exceptions, are complicated pieces. Yeah, for sure. And the ones that aren't complicated timepieces, I think we agree, probably was a gift or may have been, um, you know, something that his wife was wearing and not him. Sure. Because you could you could tell that that he was the watch lover of the family. Again, she's she's obviously still around, so she's not selling off her stuff. Uh, what 152. This is the only prop watch actually mm -hmm. from from these, and this was a this is a Quartz Hamilton watch that apparently Robin Williams wore in the movie Dead Poets Society in the late 1980s. Yeah. Um. I uh. It's been a long time since I've seen this. Um. So it says it was worn in the in the movie. Um. I I. I don't necessarily know if I, where this watch was presented because it says the actor's name on the back, right? So um, it was probably given him to wear, and it was just sort of like dedicated to him. He could keep it a afterwards. Not not yeah. not a particularly complicated watch here, but this is the only one that I would say is probably movie memorabilia. But it's entirely possible that in in some movies he's worn uh, some of these watches. I just don't know. Sure. Yeah. I don't. I don't know either. Um, but yeah, I did find this piece in particular. In particular, interesting because it is a Quartz Hamilton, but it also was in one of his more beloved movies. So I'll, this would be something I would be curious to see what kind of a value inflation it would get from that. Yeah, they're estimating one to two thousand bucks, and they do this on purpose. They they yeah. have these these estimates that are lower because they want people to start a bidding war. That's that's what they love. Um, mm -hmm. He he, you know, he has this literally just one Audemars Piguet. Was seen, didn't seem to be much of a fan. It's a yellow and black, um, this forged carbon one. I I don't recall specifically, but I believe that this one was among the very very first forged carbon watches that they ever came out with. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know, so he would have known that. So they would have marketed you know that this was forged carbon he would have been interested he clearly wasn't an autumn rp gay fan the other one was unworn and probably was his wife's mm -hmm. and so yeah. this represents you know kind of the only one if you look closely here um you know this is a watch that was worn you know you see you see like some uh little little gunk in between the screws here you see a little bit of wear in the case like somebody he wore this watch and he liked it yeah, it, it looks potentially to be a watch that has been serviced even. If you look at the you know, the screws that go around the dial, the top right one is is at an angle that probably wouldn't have been left there by AP. Well that's that's actually a, a interesting thing to point out and, and when you see stuff like that, the brands are, are usually very, very quick to uh, to change it. I remember Audemars Piguet sent a, a marketing image years ago that had one of the screws in the wrong place and then they quickly had to Photoshop it the right way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, you're you, you're right. That could have indicated servicing, and someone just put that that bolt in there wrong because these are they're not actually screws. They're actually they look like screws, but they're really bolts. Right. Um, but that's that's definitely a good point. So I guess there's a small chance it would have been like a factory issue. Um, 
you know, he either didn't care or didn't change it, or maybe it was done, you know, it, maybe it was serviced recently and, and it wasn't even like that. But that's definitely a good thing here. Anything interesting on the on the notes? Um, yeah, nothing particular. This again, this may have been a a gift. We don't know, but he definitely wore that watch. I'm trying right. to think here. I want to investigate some of these other watches to see how worn they are. <laughs> um, I'm I'm actually curious on this Bell and Ross one. Yeah, uh, this is definitely worn. You got some scuffs on the side here. Not a ton, but you know he definitely wore this watch. See around the bezel there. There's a little bit of the the PVD coating that came off. Are you looking at the blue one or the orange one? I'm looking at the orange one right now. Uh, yeah, the blue one looks like it's brand new. The orange one, I can definitely see the wear on it. I mean, he may have gone in there and, as an impulse, said, "I want, I want both of them." You yeah, know, I both. mean, you know, he could do that. Right. He had a good relationship with Turno. Um, this one was purchased at Turno, and some of the other lots, I believe, um, say that on there. Um, you know, just by looking at these watches. Again, you have this Corum with this, you know, skull on it. You have this Tag Heuer. This was their, uh, I think this is one of their golf watches. It's a digital mm -hmm. one. The digital uh, tag. Yeah, yeah. The, the micro timer. You have this Elaine Silberstein from the 90s. Definitely something that, I, I, I actually, for me, the Elaine Silberstein, it, it, it feels like the type of watch that I've always wanted someone like Robin Williams to wear. Lot 129. 129. This. Ah, uh, yeah. Again, he purchases at Turno, you know, so it wasn't like Roman. He went in there, he saw this, that he liked it, and, and, and he got this. And this is from the 90s when they were quite small. This is 38 millimeters. But I, I, I love the fact that I'm seeing so much of his personality in this collection. You see, a, you see a Panerai, for example. They're lovely watches, but does it really tell you anything about the wear? You know, I'm looking at Locked no. 128. This could be worn by anyone. Right. I do think that Silverstein is, or, or Silverstein is interesting because it is kind of a quirky piece, and that would be the character in the role that is often associated with Robin Williams as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and so I, I like that that it, you know, and, and again they don't they don't do too much too good of a job here of giving a story for each of these pieces. Um, so what out of this collection would you want? Of course, you know, budget it's not unwilling, but what what do you see here? And you think to yourself, man, this would be great. Personally. Um, I really like this uh, Ingenieur that he has, Lot 122. I've always been a fan of the watch. The association with Robin Williams, obviously. Oh, this one, a, the blue and orange one. Yeah, I was I was literally looking at that as you said it. <laughs> so this this is interesting because this was the this was announced at the IWC event where I I actually happened to meet him. Oh, so that's really interesting. So he got this watch around the time when I actually met him. So if anything, this would be the one that I would want as well because I was there and I remember meeting him that day. Yeah. No, that's that's very cool. Let's see what do they um, what do they say this one? What do they what do they think what's this going to start at? Um 2 to 3. I want do these have a start but you know this is the this Oh, the is, starting bit. Yeah, this yeah, is what I, this is what annoys me here. You you have to take this number and I think that you have to increase it automatically by 25%. Because yeah. that's like the the, the, or the, the premium. Fee. It's that, that's why I hate these auctions. You go on, you go on 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 eBay. You know what you're paying. Here it's like, you know, it's it, I don't know. It's 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 kind of skeezy the way they do it. I've never really been a fan of the practice of how they how they get you at the end. I feel that they need to be a lot more open with the fees and stuff like that. I agree with you. What do you think of Lot One Nineteen? I don't exa I, I I don't have a whole lot of experience with this brand, but is it Ikepod? Ikepod. Yeah. Oh, you're not interested this is... in this Frank Muller Turbion Minute Repeater? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the most complicated watch. Okay, so the Icapod one. Um, I'm a fan of Icapod. Um, this is, you know, a very standard design for them. I mean, this is a watch that in the market would go for about two to three thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're starting, they're estimating five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars USD. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. Um, I would definitely, you know, look at something like this. But I worry that in the context of sort of a bunch of people interested in this, this will just go for more than, than necessary. And, I, you know, I don't want a watch just because it was said it was owned by him. Because mm -hmm. he wore this. I mean, look at this case. There's dings yeah. in it. Like, Robin Williams clearly loved this. And similar to the Lane Silverstein, this is a watch that I associate with his personality. 
That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, so I think this is great. And, you know, if you look at the dings in it, you can just imagine yourself what what Mr. Williams is doing when he when those dings, uh, you know, <laughs> were created. Yeah. I like that one. So this Frank Mueller one, 125, um, they're estimating 25,000 to 35,000, which I think is the highest out of any watch here. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, I don't even know how, how this is. This is an, uh, an older one from the from the late 90s, so it's not going to be as as big. But this is early on when when tourbillons and minute repeaters were a lot more exotic. Uh, very few watches that back then included both of them. Mm -hmm. And so. I, I I believe that he purchased this. I'm guessing it doesn't say from Turneau, but it, it may have been. This is one of many Frank Muller watches that he had. Um, oh, there's a, there's an image here. Is that supposed to say that they, that he was wearing it? Oh, no, this is just some. It, yeah, it doesn't look like that's what's on his wrist in that picture. Life with Rob Marsha Gr Williams on two decades of collecting together. That's kind of a. I feel like that shirt he's wearing has a watch on it, but I have no idea. <laughs> um, there he is with yeah. one of his bicycles. Yeah. Oh, they actually have right here the. Uh, they really, they really want to sell this Franco Buller. <laughs> They're worried about that one. <laughs> it's just a lot of money, you know, because it's it's, yeah. it's it's a delicate watch, you know. It's it's great, but, um, you know, it it's it's not so hot these days because it's it's not an everyday watch, and I think what's really hot these days are everyday watches. Yeah, for sure. A lot of art. You know, the the a lot of the art is nice. He had good taste, but if you look at some of the stuff, like this is an interesting piece of art. It's like a giant version of a of a, to a plastic toy uh, Indian. Oh, up at the top. Um, uh, oh, I'm looking here at a different. Uh, yeah, it's probably one of the lots there. Lot one, the yeah. red Indian. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did have a, a a really diverse taste in fine art for sure. A lot of like, I mean, there's you know, lot nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen are all Banksies, um, with lot thirteen being estimated to go for four hundred to six hundred thousand. There's a there's a photograph here of him from apparently 1993 playing video games. He's got a Super Nintendo and he's. He's playing some other stuff. He's actually not playing Super Nintendo at, at, at that moment, but he's uh, mm -hmm. he's got a bunch of toys and stuff in there. He's wearing a watch. He looks enthralled to be playing video games. You know, you're talking about like Robin Williams mementos that you might want to own. I want to own his Super Nintendo. That would be great. That would be something, right? That I yeah. don't think that's one of the lots here. Well, if you no. look, if you look here, <laughs> he's obviously in a kid's room, right? So there's there's toys for little kids. There's a, there's a, what appears to be an Ultraman. Would it be really, wouldn't it be funny if this actually was? It has to be a kid's room. Look at the chair he's sitting on. It's a kid's chair. Yeah, I'm not seeing the picture you're looking at, but yeah. Yeah, it's on. It's an. It's it's part of this article that just talks about like their um them collecting. Um, okay. It's it seems to be. Who is this interview with even? Well, again, this is all designed to sell stuff, so you take the stuff with a grain of salt. You know, I, I if if you're reading editorial on a website whose primary uh, purpose is to sell stuff. I wouldn't exactly refer to it as highly authoritative. Yeah, that that IWC, the this is from the Plastiki, and this is related to the Rothschilds. It's a whole other story. Yeah, if you read the article on the blog to watch about the the Plastiki, it was a boat that I don't remember what their route was going to be, but it was a boat that was made from like recycled plastic or something, and the entire hull of the boat was strapped together plastic bottles. So that's why they call it the Plastiki, because it was literally made of plastic bottles. And it gotcha. had, like, they were trying to be energy independent. So there was, like, a, 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 like a bicycle-style uh, electricity generator. So you'd just be sitting there on deck all day generating electricity. And, the, and they were, like, growing, you know, kale and stuff like that to eat on board. <laughs> um, and, and Rothschild, you know, this, um, you know, he's just the heir of a lot of money. Yeah, and I remember this guy, and this is the guy that you know. I don't even know if he's still wearing this watch today. He came in, and he he wasn't even wearing matching socks. They were like different colors, you know. And it was like that, and he just walked. And th I'm not talking about Robin Williams. I'm talking about the guy that was, you know, you know, get, getting IWC to sponsor this boat. Um, right. It was just an interesting time. Um, I don't know that something like that would would happen anymore. But this was this was actually a really cool thing. So. Whoever whoever gets the plastiki watch from Robin Williams, I think that's cool. And and if you look at it, what is the limited edition number? Seven 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 out of a thousand. I don't think that that's an accident. No, that seems like something you would pick. Yeah, I I definitely think that's something you would pick. I mean, he's you know I I don't know too much about him, but 
but definitely um you know someone that was you know like symbolism like design here's one which is nice this is a i think this is part of the gsd collection this is an iwc this is a lot 120 this is um i guess this is probably when it was called the aqua timer before it was called the aqua timer these were gscs but here's an aqua timer chronograph uh black dial on the bracelet i, I it's going for three to five thousand. I think that's a little bit aggressive, uh, but you know this is one that he probably purchased in San Francisco. It's from you know he lived up there. It's from Shreve and Company, so they yeah. were they, they were a retailer, and he he probably went in there and just bought this watch. Um, is is this one of the Cousteau watches? I'm not super familiar with these early Aqua Timers. Uh, they had some limited editions with Cousteau, and there may have been a version of this, but not, it not looks this like, specific one. It actually looks like 121 is a limited edition. I'm, not, I'm also not sure if it's one of those either, but that's interesting. Uh, 121, yeah. Just this blow is, it. No, that one is, because that see, it says the tribute to the Calypso. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, so it says Cousteau Diver right on there. So yeah, it's the same design, and uh, it's interesting, because you know, he got he got both of these. These are, these are two different years, right? So he, uh, he, unless these were purchased at the same time, um, I, I you know he would have bought essentially a similar style watch two years later on a strap. Yeah, and it just looking at the pictures between the two, it looks like this Cousteau diver was worn quite a bit versus the um, this black and white the the lot one twenty. This one doesn't look like it has quite as much wear. It doesn't look it doesn't look brand new or mint by any by any means, but it definitely looks like it didn't receive as much wear as the Cousteau. It's interesting. You know what you know what I think happens? This is what I think <clears> happens a lot. If you look at a lot of his watches, <clears throat> he he's definitely into straps because he did a lot of um, sports stuff. So yeah. I so what may have happened? He may have bought it like it on the bracelet, but realized that he wanted to wear it more in a strap. And he just went in and bought a different version of it. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't think about that. But look, but just in general, look at yeah. all the watches he has on straps versus bracelets. Yeah. No. Well, that that engineer is on a strap. The uh, there's another Cousteau 123, just a couple down. That's also on a strap. Uh, that's one of the, the the internal bezel aqua timers. Yeah. Yeah. I see that here. Um, so that's yeah, another. Know, <clears throat> yeah. Most of them are on straps, though. He definitely likes the color blue, and he likes orange. I mean, you see a theme here, blue and orange. You see it again and again and again. Do you think that you're like that? If you looked at your collection, you'd be like, there's definitely a color I like? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> what color would that be? Is it, is it, does it happen to be blue and orange? Uh, it's not orange, but it is definitely blue. I don't yeah. mind orange. I don't mind orange. It's just not something that I would say that I gravitate towards. But but like the... Like the uh, the Aqua Timer Chronograph, the Cousteau that we were talking about a second ago, 121. I like that kind of kind of deep blue. So here's a. I'm looking right now at lot 141, and this is a Breitling, and this is on a bracelet. This is the Mont Brilliant. This is the, the their watch with the the Valjo 7751 in there. Uh, <laughs> this is. I, I used to joke about this because this is about as busy a dial as a as a Breitling can get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this was definitely worn. Uh, you know, it's on a bracelet. Um, I feel like he wore this when he wanted to be like conservative, but not. But this is like you don't buy this watch unless you're obsessed with watches as instruments. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 he definitely and it's it's interesting to think about someone whose profession is comedy and entertainment and acting. You don't really perceive them as being like hands-on, blue-collar. But what you're what you're really seeing a lot here is someone who was interested in cycling, interested in tools, interested in instruments. Um, you know, he has travel watches, he has diving mm -hmm. watches, he has you know world time watches, he has chronographs, he has he likes powers. I mean, he, he's obsessed with chronographs. Look at how many chronographs he has. He even had digital chronographs. Absolutely. Like yeah. Well, he's definitely into complications, chronographs in particular. But then he also likes these these art style watches. So I guess we'll we'll sort of finish off here looking at this Corum. This is a Corum bubble. Um, they called it the Night Flyer. It's got a Boone style strap. This was a big watch. This was forty five. Um, doesn't say where he bought it, but definitely was made out to him. You know, when when would something like this? fit into his character just it doesn't look like it was worn very often at all but but no. imagine him wearing this yeah 
Um, hard. It's a it, little hard to imagine, right? It, it would. I was. You know, it would have to be a statement. Like he would have to be wanting to say something with it. But I, I almost wonder if he would have put that much thought into it. You know, was it that he looked at it and he loved how different it was? The, you know, the bubble is a very interesting thing. That I mean, look at the second's hand. It's like a sword. Um, kind of curve. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he. Again, you're talking about someone who is also an art lover. And when the worlds of watches and art intersect, you can have some very interesting results. So, yeah, he got it. He liked it. He, he probably realized it wasn't to him. And he probably ended up wearing, you know, uh, a sports watch uh, mm -hmm. more often than not. I mean, even with the dress watches, he liked the Tonneau style case from Frank Muller. That's pretty much all that's represented in the Frank Muller ones. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting one. You know, a doxa. <laughs> I saw an that. An azimuth. Yeah. Um, he, he, he's also big into limited editions. Like so many of these watches are limited editions. Yeah, I yeah. I was, I was looking at that. That Dox is really interesting too because it's it's a PVD coated Shark Hunter. What I can't even tell what case model this is. The the Sea Conqueror. Oh, it's the five. It's the five thousand T um, Sea Conqueror. That's an interesting watch for him. I think. Yeah, I mean, you you look at it closely here. Um, you know, it's it's hard to tell how much he wore it. I wouldn't say he gave it a lot of time, but no. that he's into it, that he's into this stuff, that he was, you know, he has one dock, so he just sort of wanted one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it says, you know, it has extra links, for example, in the box. What does that mean? Well, at least it was sized. Yep. You know? Yeah, um, I mean, he probably wore it a little bit. It's hard to say. So what I like about this is you have a real indication that he wasn't even he he wasn't pretentious. Even though he had, you know, minute repeater tourbillons, nothing stopped him from getting something that was a lot less. And that what, what's the estimate here? A hundred and fifty to three hundred bucks. <laughs> On the Doxa? Yeah. Wow. Again, it's going to go more than that, but you know, even this azimuth. That that is a more simple watch. It says five hundred to a thousand bucks. Yeah. And this azimuth, which I think is interesting, he had all these fancy IWC pilots watches, right? So he and this was the time when he was definitely like you know in with IWC. Yet yeah. For whatever reason, he wanted basically a sterile, a sterile you know aviator watch, and I think he got this azimuth one because it was an aviator style, which he liked. No name on the dial at all. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I'd be curious to hear the story behind acquiring this. It is it is big, fifty five millimeters. So I wonder if it was the size that attracted him to this particular like pilot's watch versus something like a like a Stoa or something like that. And if you look at this azimuth, you know the case appears to be in really good condition. And the reason I mention that is that at this size, the, a watch like this would get banged up a little bit. It's definitely been worn. Definitely been yeah. worn. <clears throat> so okay, so let's recap a little bit. Robin Williams, um, you know, a, 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 a beloved en entertainment fixture in the lives of many. Um, mm -hmm. Tragic death, you know, he committed suicide, not not uncommon in the world of, uh, of today. Um, that's a whole other story unto itself, but, you know, definitely a tragedy. I think that, you know, he was, you know, someone that was missed on a lot of levels. And for us, as people are watch lovers, you know, he was one of us. Yeah. In, in at least him being a watch lover, just you looking at these watches, and again, this doesn't represent his full collection, but just looking at these, you see someone that wasn't just like, I like luxury, or I like famous brands, or I want to show off. He he doesn't seem to have really cared about showing off. He mm -hmm. seems to have got the watches that he likes, and he seems to have had a real diversity in taste. It was very unpretentious. I mean, he's Robin Williams. He could buy a lot of expensive watches. I mean, that's that's who expensive watches are designed for. So I'm glad to see that he went out there a little bit and, you know, definitely about luxury watches, but he didn't, he didn't stick to that. So right. the, the auction is on October 4th, uh, 2018. Um, maybe we'll get the show out um, in time for that, but I just think that it was really interesting to take a look at this. And Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. So again, this has been the uh, Spending Time Podcast. We just looked at some of the watches that were owned by Robin Williams are going to auction soon. I hope that the people getting these will like them, and we will chat with you next time. Thanks, everyone.